And Liz, um, looks like you guys might have a few extra minutes, so just do what you need to do. Go ahead, Liz. Uh, hello, everyone. This is interesting. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear myself out there. Hey, Todd, how's it going? Hello, I'm doing well. Good to see you. Good to see um, you, too. Yeah, uh, so I'm just going to introduce Todd real quick before we begin. Uh, so for those that don't know, Todd and Christy Kincaid uh, work in Rome. They've been there since 2014, and they have a ministry with refugees and migrants. Um, they help teach English and just meet the needs of those people there, and they're gonna, Todd's going to tell you a bit about that today. Um, they've been there, yeah, since 2014, so uh, six years now. And um, yeah, they're just doing some amazing things there. I got to be with them for six months uh, last year, and it was just an incredible time. Um, probably, I, I tell people it was probably the best time of my life, and I'm just so thankful for that season. And um, they do have opportunities for people to help out. And Todd, maybe you can tell them a little bit about the apprenticeship too. I think we'll have time for that. So sure. um, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to give the floor to you, Todd, and I'll just start off by um, maybe just asking you to introduce yourself real quick. Maybe tell us real quick about um, your family and, um, and we'll start with that. Yeah. Well, my name is Todd uh, Kincaid. I'm, I've met many of you face to face and um, yeah, it was a pleasure to have Liz with us these for six months last year, well, year and a half ago now I guess but um, yeah. my wife and I we just celebrated Monday our 29th anniversary we've been married 29 years she's in the states right now and I'm here by myself just COVID situations you know um, I couldn't I wasn't able to leave uh, just because of things going on but um, we have three children, Michael, Adam, and Maddie, and right now they are 25, 20, and 15, so five years apart, and uh, yeah, we've been in missions since, in one way or another, either as full-time missionaries or in the pastorate since 1991, so yeah, God's been good, and he's been faithful to us, so we're, we're glad to be with you guys today, even though it's virtually. Yeah, it's interesting, these, you know. <laughs> It's cool that we can do it this way too. I sure. think, you know, mm -hmm. this virus has introduced new ways of doing things, doing life. And so, um, yeah. yeah, it's great. There's a nine hour time difference. So it's what, like almost eight o'clock PM right. where you are. So that takes some getting used to. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, anyways, um, let's just start off. I'll ask you, um, just what's, what, What's your guys' vision for Rome? Like when you went there originally in 2014, like what was, what was your planning and has it like gone according to that plan? And like, as you've moved forward through time, has your vision changed much? Um, I don't know if that question makes sense, but sure. I'll give it to you. Sure. Yeah. No, uh, the, the heart of our vision was, you know, we really were burdened by the Lord that um, the major cities in Europe were very strategic, especially, especially for, um, I mean, Europe, Europe needs the gospel, obviously, but especially for reaching unreached people groups um, through migration and, um, you know, people groups that are moving. And um, so, you know, we praying to come to Europe. We, we prayed about London. We prayed about Paris. We'd spent some years in France back in the 90s. And the Lord led us to Rome, um, which was a little bit of a surprise at the time. Uh, we made our first trip here in 2009, and Rome was not the most strategic place to be, you know, for migrant work at the time. Of course, we moved here in April of 2014, and like six months later, this huge historic uh, wave of migration broke loose, which Liz, you experienced some of that when you were here. And literally just people from every place you can imagine – you know, uh, especially from the unreached places, the 1040 window, those countries just flooding into Europe um, through Libya, across the sea, into Italy. Um, and so we've had literally, you know, opportunity for hundreds, if not thousands of people um, from very unreached places to, to be, to encounter the gospel, to 
you know, to know, know a believer and, and to, to experience God's word uh, for the first time. And so that's kind of the, the heart of our, what our vision was. And obviously it's fluctuated some and how do we do this type of thing. But the core of the vision hasn't changed. And we even feel led to do this in other places in Europe as the Lord opens the door. Nice. So, um, yeah, so that's what I think the amazing thing about Rome is you have all these people coming to you. Like you've said that before, like from all over the world, it's like the hub. That's where you've yeah. gotten you use the hub as one of your ministry um, names. And it's just it's a hub of so many different cultures and places. And so you're meeting people from all over with some like crazy stories too. some of the stories you're hearing of people who left, you know, fled like Africa and gone over the mm -hmm. Mediterranean and. Um, you know, I just remember hearing some of those stories and, um, but it's, so yeah, it's just, it's incredible. The opportunity you have of people all over the world coming to you and coming to the center. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, Agape Center? Yeah, we, we opened the Agape Center. It's coming on six years now. Um, and basically we just wanted a, a way to, you know, be in the community, to connect with people. Uh, and it's, it's more or less a community center we're looking to hopefully find a, a bigger space and provide even more services. But we didn't initially began with, you know, providing Italian lessons for people who are in Italy and English lessons. People want to learn English and just, you know, help with homework and things of that nature for kids. And we really have three different groups, three different uh, types of people, I should say. Uh, we have refugees. These are guys who, you know, have come across the Sahara desert and across the sea and, you know, put their life at risk to try to make a life here in, in Europe. We have migrant families who are people who have settled in and are raising their kids here. Um, and we have kids English. We have, it's a big draw for especially South Asians. And we also have some university students who come, you know, um, and in the past six years, we've had people from 60 different countries come into the center. Um, and six of the 10 largest unreached people groups in the world. So majority right now, yeah. as you know, is they're from Bangladesh who are coming. And uh, the Bangladeshi Muslims are the largest unreached people group in the world, 160 million people. Uh, you know, just a fraction of a percentage are believers. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing that the one of the most unreached people groups in the world and they're coming right like they're the main yeah. kind of group of people coming to the center and you know That's you're going true. and other you know, families and going to eat with them and they're you know yeah. it's just like yeah. becoming with them and, and yeah it's amazing and um so uh, maybe you could tell us something you know recently that's like a a good a story recently of, of that captures your work in rome um it doesn't have to be recent it can also be you know years ago but like do you have any any thoughts on that any any good story yeah yeah you know, i was thinking of um there's a young a young man named keita who we've uh actually scott and esther spencer were here visiting last fall from las vegas many of you know them maybe they're watching today and we visiting one of the re refugee camps here we just kind of bumped into keita on the on literally on the street outside the camp and we had a cup of coffee and just began a relationship with him. Um, and he's from a Muslim background, Ivory Coast. He came to he came to Europe when he was like 14. Uh, he arrived here when he was 15. You know, the trip from Ivory Coast to, to Italy was a two year voyage for him. And um, so he's he's been, you know, we really grown close to him and the past six weeks we've been doing a discovery bible study with him um, which is a way of just kind of presenting the, the scripture to, to non-believers in a way that they're kind of discovering the truth of the scripture themselves and uh, this past week we actually were in Isaiah 53 reading about the this servant who's suffering and um, so yeah we're coming into you know presenting the life of Jesus and um, I was just with him this week, uh, just sitting and listening to his story. And Liz, you've heard a lot of these stories, but um, if you can picture like a Ford Ranger pickup truck um, and crossing 
crossing the Sahara Desert in the bed of a Ford Ranger pickup truck. Um, you know, it's like a two week journey just to cross the desert. And if you can imagine in the bed of that pickup truck, there are 45 people. And if you can just think about that for a moment, you know, he was, we were talking about, which is not something refugees often, you know, takes them some time to get to where they even want to talk about this. Um, I just posted a, on our Facebook group, a, a link about, you know, they're selling African slaves in Libya for $400 a piece right now. Um, so these guys go through things that you just can't even imagine. And that's before they get into the boat, you know? And so Keita just this week was telling me, you know, when, when he was uh, put into the boat to cross the sea, which typically it's at gunpoint because people don't want to get into the boat. It's, it's such a dangerous thing that he, could, he couldn't even sit down because he'd been beaten so hard in his lower back by the people in Libya. And yet, you know, so here's this young guy who went all these thousands of miles and on the street corner somewhere in Rome, we encounter each other. And, you know, he met with me the other day, just, he, he called me and said, I'd like to meet with you. It's something I want to talk to you about. And, and uh, we've been praying with him. We pray in Jesus name. We're very open about being believers. I'm not hiding that from him. And the Lord's done some good things for him. He's given him documents and he's had a little job here recently, but it's, uh, there's a big job, a, a nice job, set, a settled job that he wants to get. And um, so he called me up and said he wanted to meet with me. So I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what, I wonder what he needs. And when we met, he says, you know, I just wanted us to pray together because I, I, I just want God to give me this job. And so, so you know, just, he's one of many that we're in contact with. Um, but just the sovereignty of God to connect us at the right time and the right place and and he's on a journey now, you know, discovering who Jesus is and, um, you know, just a very young, bright young man, you know, who has a lot of, in front of him. Um, but that's just one example of many that I could give recently. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That sounds like God's really working in his life and Absolutely. he's seeking out. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. So sure. what, so, so how things change now? I know uh, with COVID, it's shake, it shook up everything. You know, you can't have classes like before all your English classes. And um, so I know you guys have been doing some things, uh, you know, in the meantime, as you have waited for life to get kind of back to normal. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've done with the movie during these times of COVID? Yeah, well, you know, we were, moving along at a normal pace until like the second week of March. And, um, you know, as you know, or may, may not know, Italy had a, a pretty hard, you know, couple of months that we had a complete 100% lockdown here for about two months. So, um, so my, my wife and my kids, they went 67 days without ever leaving the house, not even one time. <laughs> So it's pretty intense here, you know. Um, yeah. So obviously we had to, you know, close the center. Um, and so as we began to pray about, you know, what to do, the Lord is kind of, you know, most of our people, our migrant families, they work in the tourist sector, restaurants, um, or they work, you know, in hotels or as tour guides, some, some kind of, and of course, since February, tourism here has been practically zero. Um, so many of the families are hurting. Uh, the fathers are out of work, and they have been since February. And there's not, if they don't have a contract, a legitimate contract job, they don't get any like unemployment or any assistance. So we just prayed, you know, about things and just felt the Lord leading us to do food distribution to these families, which we, we didn't really have a budget for it. We'd never done it before as far as logistically, you know, how to do it. Um, so from May, uh, we've done one, one time per month, we've been, we t actually take the food into Rome, different areas of Rome and deliver to the houses, probably 30, 40 pounds worth of food uh, to the families. And it really, you know, ultimately what we do at the center, uh, the goal of that is to connect with these families, to get into their homes, which you've done that some Liz, when you were here, um, because 
you know, when you're in their home and, and you're sharing meals and you're sharing your life, that's, that's when, you know, spiritual conversations can start. And so, you know, we went from having, you know, one or two, three families we occasionally would, you know, have this opportunity with to having like almost 30 families that the last three months we've been in their home, we've delivered food, we've shared, you know, they always fix you some tea or something. Uh, but most importantly, we prayed with them. We've left them gospel materials in their language. Um, and we prayed in Jesus name in each one of these homes. And so we're really focusing right now on, on the fathers, of uh, these families, because they're, you know, we don't see them often to center the, the mothers come with the kids, the fathers are working. And so right now, many of them are unemployed. They're sitting at home and many of them are in quite a desperate place. Um, and especially in a Muslim family for the father to come to faith first is very important. And so we're, um, we're praying for them. We've even made like a, a prayer sheet with their names and their faces on it. Um, I'm assuming I had coffee today with a Muslim guy from India and we're just, you know, building those relationships. And so, so really COVID we've also done a couple of medical clinics in this time, but the Lord, uh, we had some doctors from the university actually called us and they came and did this full free medical clinic at the center. So these are things that we have never done before, um, but God has opened up these doors and really it's, it's, you know, advanced the ball down the field uh, quite a bit further than we have ever been before. So it's actually been pretty advantageous for us in spite of the difficulties. Yeah. yeah. I know it's pretty amazing that like God has been able to turn something that, I mean, really should have kept us all away from each other into like, you're, you're going into almost all these people's houses. Like, yeah, that's yeah. Just incredible to me. And that's like where you, you said that what you said, it starts there, like in the houses and meeting with yeah. them and building these relationships with families, yeah. with the father. I know like, uh, from my experience at the center, you didn't really get to meet a lot of the fathers of the kids. It was mostly the mothers coming. So like, what an amazing opportunity now you're getting to see the fathers and build these relationships. So that's, that's an answer to prayer. Um, it's exciting stuff. I love seeing, you know, you know, your posts on Facebook on, on the group there, just pictures, all those pictures of, of the distribution that just like, it's mm. just, it's amazing. It's exciting. And um, so uh, we, we do have a little extra time. Um, and so I think we're going to uh, have some questions from sure. anyone in the audience as a question uh quickly though i did want to ask you uh, if you wanted to share i don't know if there's anything going on with the apprenticeship this year but if, if you wanted to maybe talk briefly about that and because that's what i did with you mm -hmm. and i know that's still pursuing so if you want to briefly talk on that yeah of course we have a program it's it's the full program is nine months and we're developing liz and another girl were the, the first two to kind of come through um, but the idea is to give people first-hand mission experience, you know, in a, in a cross-cultural setting uh, with mentoring from people who have experience and also training along the way, you know, how to reach Muslims, how to reach Hindus, that type of thing. Um, we're moving ahead by faith. We have, you know, at least two people, one from Europe, one from the U.S., who are definitely going to be involved and two others who are maybes. But, you know, right now people can't travel from the States to Italy unless they're resident. And so there's a lot of complications there. Um, but we're still, you know, the idea is that people who really feel some kind of a call or at least want to pursue, you know, find out more about mission life, um, gives them a hands-on experience and, and immersion into that. Um, and especially those who maybe feel a long-term call, you know, can be a stepping stone from if they've had some training or whatever, they're actually experiencing that and moving into a full-time call. So we have lots, lots of information about that videos and, you know, pamphlets and things like that so if anyone's interested in that we certainly can tell them more about it great yeah i i highly recommend it, it was a it was a great time and uh, it, it was you, you did a great job we were your guinea pigs and yeah you were i appreciate you doing that for good. us you did good. yeah i loved it so all right i'm gonna pass it over to my dad uh okay. i think are you and we'll see if there's any questions out there for you thanks liz Yep. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Todd. Uh, Todd, it was it was uh, amazing being a little, just seeing a little bit of that, and just being down at the center and watching the uh, life that took place there. 
you know, often when when uh, the team, Todd's team was teaching English, the, the parents would be waiting outside in the, often in the, sometimes in the cold and rain. And, and so his, the rest of the team was out there just ministering to them. And then all the, just all the things that have happened since I've been there, it's amazing. So do we, we can open it up for a few minutes. We have, actually have like about 15 minutes. Um, and so we can, until Dr. Lewis comes on. And uh, so I wanna invite people online. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you can ask questions. And if you're in the audience, you can ask questions for Pastor Todd, either comments, questions, uh, just go on a, you know, popcorn. Um, anybody want to come up? We'll have the mic for you. Or anybody online, you just uh, speak up because we don't have too many people on there right now. It looks like... Okay, Mrs. Fortin, come on up. I'm going to be just, just for COVID reasons, I'm going to keep the microphone okay. right there. Okay, sir. Pastor Todd, right okay, there. Okay, Pastor Todd, yay! I do have a question. You were talking about food distribution to families, and that it wasn't something, if I understood, you have budgeted. So is there, let's say, is, first I want to know, is food available if you wanted to go buy it? Yes. And then if you did, uh, uh, about how much money would it cost for your 40-pound package? If, say, we wanted to sponsor five families. So tell me how we would do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the food is available and we, we buy, you know, we, most of these are South Asian families. And so we, you know, go down and buy like whole bulk, you know, we'll buy a hundred kilo bags of rice and things like that, you know? Um, so I'm trying to think on the fly here, how much, um, for yeah i would say you know with the prices that we're getting a family is let's just say in the neighborhood of 70 dollars okay that's so, really so spent, if i yeah, wanted to send let's say i have 70 dollars how do i get it to you well we have an account at iagm so it can go through iagm and if it's if as long as there's some kind of note on it that this is for food distribution or uh, we're like we're preparing to do it here in another week or so, um, so that that would be, yeah, that would that would come to us and we could use it for food. So seventy dollars, if I understand, seventy dollars would be enough food for the one family forty pound package. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, mm -hmm. and then do you have a greater need than food distribution that you haven't shared so far? What's your greatest need? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, our greatest need is our, I would say, teammates, people full time on the ground here, uh, putting their hand to the plow with us. I would say that's our greatest need. So you can pray for that, please. Okay, we are going to pray right now. We do thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you for the gift of Pastor Kincaid and his family and the years of service that they've uh, given to you. Lord, we pray that you would raise up workers and they would be faithful and they would be given to whatever needs to be done so that the gospel can be shared and many can be saved and converted and be a part of the kingdom of God. We do thank you, Lord. We pray that you place a hedge around those workers that are, that are being um, touched by you right now and don't let anything come against them or hinder them from the call that you have on their life to go and be a part of that ministry. We uh, give this need to you, Lord. And, um, Lord, we pray for the many that are there. Continue to protect them, keep them strong and healthy. Thank you for um, the food ministry. Uh, Lord, we pray that souls would be saved. And we thank you for Pastor Kincaid. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. Uh, Past, uh, Doc, or Todd, I'm going to call He doesn't like me to call him Pastor Kincaid, but he's a pastor. This guy's a shepherd. <laughs> um, so, Todd, what uh, we were, somebody asked in the audience what the name of that person was again that we can be praying uh, yeah. for. Yeah, his name is Keita. K E I T A. Keita. Okay. All right. Other questions? Come right on up. 
Don't hesitate. Anybody? If not, anybody online? Dr. Lewis on there yet? He was just in, he was in Rome. I don't know, Todd, how long ago was that? Was that a year ago? I think it was a year and a half ago. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Time is going yeah. by too quick. Okay, so there's, we have no more questions. I'm gonna give you one more chance. Oh, we got one coming up here. This is Tyler from Tacoma, Washington. You gotta move faster now though, it's right now. <laughs> John. Hello. Just have a question if a fella maybe to uh, uh, continue momentum from the dorms here uh, learning or was to come over for your apprenticeship program, uh, what would he want to bring for finances to uh, make that nine month stretch and be comfortable and then also um, contributing at the same time? Yeah, actually, we've talked to Pastor Powell about that, that, you know, the the minister school there and the apprenticeship that somehow we might, you know, partner together. Um, I could uh, right now in my head, I don't have all the figures. I probably make a mistake if I send it to you, but we have plenty of information on that. So if you get, you know, either my phone number or my email from Liz or pastor Jim or pastor Powell or someone, um, I can definitely get that to you. But we, we have a, actually begun a conversation about how the apprenticeship and the ministry school there in Tacoma could kind of, you know, work together to give a cross-cultural experience to people who, who are studying there as well. So, yeah, so, so I can definitely get that to you, brother. No, I'm not trying to evade the question. I just, I don't have it all here in my mind, you know, so. Are you, are you asking about the, uh, how much it costs? Uh, yeah, and I suppose to talk to Liz about uh, her experience in the situation and, and uh, yeah, okay. The conversation yeah. has been started. Yeah, I could, you could talk to me too. I've got a, Thank you, brother. Uh, you know, I love the idea of connecting the dormitories here in Tacoma with your dorms there, uh, mm -hmm. Todd. So we'll just have to kind of keep that, uh, keep communicating on that. We'll let Liz be our little liaison. Dr. Hansen. Good evening, Todd. Evening. Hey, uh, I was asked to, uh, if you need an English teacher there in Rome, did you get that? Uh, yeah, because you know when I'm when I prayed when I said to pray for workers, something that yeah. we need desperately is English teachers. Uh, we have, you know, uh, right now we have my wife and I we're the only ones who teach English, and um, we have fifty or sixty migrant children, but we could probably have a hundred if you know if we had enough people yeah. teaching, which that means. Those are families. Every child represents a family. And so we have a great need for English teachers. And, you know, you can, you can drop in and start teaching immediately adults and children both. Absolutely. If I can teach English, anyone can do it. <laughs> I say the same thing. I'm not an English teacher, but I'm doing yeah. it. So. <laughs> yeah. Liz, tell us what the day was like with Pastor Todd in the in the in the dorms. You got two minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, well, it was different every day, but we did have two days a week where we would study together. Uh, Todd um, would teach us, and we had some books we were going through. Um, so we did that two days a week, and then um, we had two like we had multiple days where we would go and help teach. Um, at the center, uh, Morgan would teach Italian a lot. Um, she was one of the other girls in the apprenticeship and I helped teach English for the kids. Um, yeah, we would try to do some ministry evangelism, like outreach, uh, once or twice a week as well, like meet with, uh, people at the refugee camps, uh, get coffee together. I love that. That was some of my favorite times. Um, there's great coffee in Italy. So it's not just the coffee, it was the fellowship. Um, but, and uh, yeah, so we would do that as well. Um, we had a team uh, dinner together every Friday. That was also actually one of my favorite times. We would just get together and yeah, have one of Christy's amazing meals and then pray together and go over, you know, things that we were talking about, like books that we were reading and um, yeah, just have that time together. And so it was a mixture. It was like normal life. Um, you know, it wasn't all just 
go, go, go. There was a lot of times where you're just relaxed, but also times where you're studying and reading and it was just real life. And that's what I loved about it. Um, I got to spend a lot of time at the Kincaid's house and with their daughter, Maddie, who I love. And um, yeah, it was just, it was really, really a uh, special time and, you know, um, just full of different activities and yeah. So, okay. Am I two minutes up? You did good, Liz. <laughs>